My name is Liz Paulus and I'm with College Bound AZ. Today is January 20th, 2018, and we are at American Legion Post number 26 in Mesa, Arizona, to interview William Paul Brummy. My name is Javon Good with College Bound AZ. I'm going to be asking the next set of questions. Bill, were you, where and when were you born? I was born on uh, December 31st, 1943, Oak Park, Illinois. Who were your parents and what were their jobs? My father was Marvin Ray Brummy. He was an obstetrician gynecologist in Elmhurst, Illinois. And my mother was Marion uh, Alice, and she was a housewife. Do you have any brothers and sisters? I'm the oldest of eight. I have one brother and six sisters. Did any of them serve in the military? My brother was also a combat medic in Vietnam. What were you doing before you entered the service? Uh, flunking out of college. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, uh, I had uh, graduated from Wheaton Academy, uh, a private school in Wheaton, Illinois, in 1961. Went to the University of Illinois Central YMCA Junior College and uh, did not have a stellar academic career. My name is Jasmine Nava with College Brown AZ and I'm going to ask the next set of questions. In which branch of the military did you serve? Uh, U.S. Army. Did you enlist or were you drafted in, if you're enlisted, why that specific branch? I enlisted in the Army. Uh, I had originally applied for the Marine Corps flight training program, was accepted, but decided I didn't want to be a, a pilot at that time, and uh, I liked the Army. What happened when you departed from training camp and during your early days of training? Uh, I went to a basic training in Fort Knox, Kentucky, then went to Fort Sam Houston uh, for medical training then Brooks Army Medical Center for specialist training. It was a surgical specialist. Do you recall your instructors? If so, what were they like? I remember my, uh, my uh, platoon sergeant in basic training. He was about five foot four, Korean vet, didn't like anybody that was taller than he was. <laughs> so we had a, a acrimonious relationship, but uh, he was a great guy. How do you adapt to military life, including the physical regimen, barracks, food, and social life? I absolutely love the military. Uh, I love basic training. Uh, I was in good physical condition, uh, and uh, I, I excelled with the, the physical, mental, uh, loved the food. Did you receive any specialized training? If so, in what? Yes, I was a surgical specialist, operating room specialist, 91D20. Uh, My name is Madison Ish with College Round AZ, and I will be asking the next set of questions. Where did you serve? I served uh, Fort Knox, Kentucky, uh, Fort Sam Houston, Texas, uh, Fort Leonard Wood, Fort McPherson in Atlanta, Georgia, um, 20th Station Hospital in Nuremberg, Germany, and uh, all over two corps in Vietnam. Um, where in Vietnam did you stay and what are some memories that you, you have of those experiences? Oh, I was uh, uh, all over two corps, which was the second highest area in South Vietnam and uh, I served as a, a medic and a surgical specialist over there. If you were on the front lines, what combat actions did you witness? Uh, a lot, uh, both with, with the infantry and then, then treating the wounded at, uh, at fire bases. What were your duties when you were not on the front lines? Uh, just holding regular sick call. And 
My name is Diana Garcia. I am with College Run AZ, and I will be asking the next set of questions. If you saw combat, how did you feel when witnessing casual casualties and destruction? Uh, it's like anything that, I mean, you can't, can't imagine nothing that I ever did in my life prior to that uh, compared to it. It was, uh, it was uh, horrible, destructive, uh, exhilarating. That's strange, but uh, unbelievable. And it never leaves you. What kind of friendships did you form while serving and with whom? I basically liked everybody in my company. I was, I was well treated, uh, uh, particularly the other medics. And uh, tried to maintain relationships after the, after the war, but I only, uh, I only met one person from my company after, after the war. How did you stay in touch with family and friends back home? Uh, writing very few letters. <laughs> I, was, I was not a big writer, and uh, uh, I probably wrote maybe six letters in one year back to my family. What did you do for recreation or when you were off duty during combat? Just hung around. There wasn't much else to do other than R&R, &R, which you got once for a week over there. And I went to Bangkok, Thailand. Where were you when Vietnam ended? I was a uh, railroad police officer in Chicago, Illinois, when the war ended. How did you return home? I flew back home uh, straight from Vietnam to uh, San Francisco and was discharged the same day I came home from the military. How were you received by your family and community? I was received fairly well by my family. Uh, uh, the community, not so much. How did you readjust to civilian life? I don't know if you ever really adjust uh, to civilian life, but uh, I, uh, I've always been employed, and uh, that's about <laughs> Have you remained in contact with or reunited with fellow veterans? If so, who? Uh, nobody I served with, but uh, I've been uh, basically, most of my friends are, are veterans or police officers. Are you a member of any veteran organization? If so, which? I'm a member of uh, Vietnam, life member of the 1st Cavalry Division Association, um, past commander of the VFW in Mesa, Arizona, and uh, past officer in this post, the American Legion. What have you done since separating from the military? I was in uh, medical research for, uh, for three years. Uh, I was a, a police officer in Chicago for 17 years. I was head of security for America West Airlines for 15 years. And uh, in between times, I owned a couple businesses. And now I'm 100% uh, I'm disabled. Uh, in the VA and living a retired life. I'm Amy Bryan with College Bound and I'll be asking the next set of questions. How did your war experiences affect your life? Uh, immeasurably. It, uh, I, I, can't, uh, I can't imagine how my life would have been if I would have not have gone into the military or, or Vietnam. Uh, like I said, I'm 100% uh, uh, disabled with PTSD uh, and have been for 13 years. Um, it's, uh, it's 
It's caused uh, uh, two uh, failed marriages. Uh, I have an estranged son. Um, it changed. It changed my life uh, 180 degrees from what I thought it would be. Are there things you avoid because of your experience? I avoid crowds. Uh, I avoid uh, fireworks. Um, that's basically um, I avoid personal relationships. <laughs> What are some life lessons you learned from military service? Discipline, um, how to conquer fear, uh, how to be a caregiver, and uh, that. How has military service impacted your feelings about war and the military in general? I love the military. Uh, war, uh, it's, it's been around forever. I think it always will be. Uh, I think we have to be very careful why we go to war and be very, very aware of what uh, the toll is on the individuals that are called to fight the war. Is there one memory about a patient that sticks in your mind? He, yes, he, he really he wasn't a patient very long. Uh, I had a helicopter crash right in front of me. It wasn't from enemy fire, but uh, it had crashed and uh, one of the pilots was, was still alive and was was screaming because the aircraft was on fire and uh, he was uh, we we got him out and I, I really thought we could save him and uh, unfortunately he he died rather rather quickly and uh, I can still see his face and, and still hear the screams and uh, I dream about it at night and that was, uh, that's one thing that's really stuck with me. What message would you like to leave for future generations who will view slash hear this interview? There, are, I, there is nothing greater than serving your country, whether it's the military uh, or any of the other, other programs. Uh, I'm bias toward the military. It's, it's a great honor to serve. You learn a lot. Uh, this country has given us a lot and we need to give back to it. Is there anything you feel like we haven't discussed or should be added to this interview? If so, what? I, I just have a, a few things. I uh, <laughs> One of the reasons I was flunking out of college is I was a, uh, I couldn't pass English 101 writing essays, and I ended up being a uh, fairly prolific poet, and I had several poems about Vietnam published and uh, a textbook of the, of the Vietnam Wars for uh, uh, students. And uh, I was fortunate to uh, write songs with the lady that published this, and uh, she liked my poetry, and I had a few published in that. Uh, and I have a, I have my scrapbook, little dog-eared now. It's a uh, just a history of the First Cavalry Division, which was my unit in Vietnam from '66 uh, through '69. And, it's, uh, I look at it occasionally, not often, but occasionally. Yeah. So I have some additional questions I'd like to ask. Uh, where did you serve in Vietnam? I served up in uh, 
II Corps, which was, uh, Vietnam was di divided into four different areas. Uh, I Corps was up by the North Vietnamese border. I was in II Corps and it was called the Central Highlands, which were basically mountains and, and valleys. Out of all your specialized training, how much proved to be useful? Quite a, quite a bit uh, as, as far as basic trauma medicine uh, on the police department. And uh, I was always kind of the go-to guy uh, if somebody got injured or we traffic accidents and that. Uh, and I, I still do it today. I just, I just did the other day uh, in a car accident. I just, it's just something that, uh, that was ingrained in me, and I'll stop and render care when I can. Um, when you first learned that you were going overseas to Vietnam, what did you think? What was your first thought? Well, I volunteered quite a few times before they ever took me. Uh, I wanted to go, and basically for the. A lot of guys won't admit it, but it's the macho reason I joined the Army. I want to see what combat is like, see if I'm a coward or not. Yeah. Uh, Bill, this is Liz Paulus, and uh, we have a request, if you wouldn't mind, reading one of your poems. I have this one right here. Alrighty. Was the character of my valor less intense than those at Lexington? Was the pain of my wounds any less severe than those at Normandy? And was my loneliness any less sorrowful than those at Inchon? Then why am I forgotten amongst those remembered as heroes? Uh, Bill, my name is Liz Paulus, and I just wanted to follow up. Um, your time in Vietnam when you had a, a daily routine. Um, would, I know that you worked in triage, but did you have any other experience other than uh, your time right there at triage? I did uh, a lot of medics, particularly with medical companies over there. We were on MedCap missions, which was medical uh, civil action programs, where we'd go out to Montagnard villages uh, and Treat the treat the population that ever had any medical treatment. My name is Dana Garcia, and what was a task as an orderly? I don't know. I was never an orderly. <laughs> I was a surgical orderly in high school. But, uh, yeah, yeah, so yeah, as a yeah. yeah. Uh, as a surgical technician, I was a surgical technician. Uh, and that basically is a scrub nurse, a surgical tech, giving instruments to doctors during surgery. Bill, this is Liz Paulus again. Didn't you mention to me one time about uh, how you would be overwhelmed by the number of soldiers coming in that needed treatment yeah. and what your role might have changed yeah. to at that time? I, I uh, ended up doing a, a lot of triage and, and triage uh, and the military is, is a little bit different than civilian life. You're basically picking out people that you know you're going to survive and they get treated first. So you might have someone with a, a severe head wound where you know, uh, brains are leaking out, or you, or you know they're not going to they're not going to survive. So you treat somebody with less serious injuries first, and you leave them. You leave them basically. You alleviate their pain, if you can. Uh, but it's the motto of the medical corps in the in the army is conserve the fighting strength. So you you're treating people that are going to survive and can go back to combat. What was that first day like? My first, well, my first day, uh, I arrived out at, at the medical company and they had a helicopter with, with six bodies come in and uh, I was sent out there. They 
always send the new guy out and to remove the bodies off the off the aircraft and or the helicopter, and they they'd been out there for a period of time, and it was uh, it's the only time I ever got sick, physically sick, uh, seeing seeing the dead bodies, and that and it was uh, that stuck with me. Did you ever do sure. surgery? Oh yes. Yeah. Can you tell us about that? Uh, I did. I did a lot of uh, surgery over in Vietnam. Uh, I was very good at my hands, and I used to be able to, and that without a lot of scarring. And then after my my time in the uh, in the military, I was in artificial heart research, uh, uh, doing heart. Uh, heart surgery on 110 pound calves and then I was well, went to Michael Reese Department of Anesthesiology I was a senior research assistant doing surgery on rats of all things microsurgery but so my name is Diana Garcia and I have another follow-up question how was your relationship with your siblings I have a great relationship with my brother because we lived together and he was a combat medic. Uh, uh, I'm friends with my six sisters. I, I rarely see them. Um, uh, I'm kind of a quiet individual. so, And we're scattered all over the country. So. But I do get along with my brother. And what was a typical day like for you? Where? In combat, well, at uh, with the infantry, it was it was walking uh, with with your pack. Uh, the medical company, uh, it was we worked twenty hour days, seven days a week, and uh, if we didn't have casualties, we had uh, sick call for the whole uh, whole brigade, which consisted of two battalions, about a thousand guys, so, and a lot of, a lot of sick call. Uh, if you weren't treating people, you were filling sandbags or, <laughs> uh, or just taking a break when you could. Um, this is Amy, Brian. Uh, Bill, how old were you when you went to Vietnam? I was 22. 22 or 23, yeah, 22, I think, yeah. Were there any wounds that you sustained in Vietnam? No. Did you go to college before you went to Vietnam? Oh, yes, oh, yeah, uh, off and on for about three years. Were you in uh, the military while in college? I was in Air Force ROTC. So you originally wanted to be a pilot before a yes. medic? Yes. I started out in college and uh, it was a professional pilot curriculum at University of Illinois. Here. What made you change to a medic? I don't. I'm not. I'm not quite sure. I, uh, my dad was. A, my dad was a doctor. I've got you know, aunts who are nurses, and uh, when you're the oldest son of a doctor, they expect you to become a doctor, so I figured I'd probably make them happy and try out something in the military that was medicine related. Bill, uh, this is Liz Paulus again. Tell us about the orphanage. We, uh, we were down at Fantiette. We were down there for uh, uh, quite a while. We were a detached battalion and we, there was a Catholic orphanage in town, and we had, <coughs> they would come out occasionally to have some of the children treated, and our company just sort of adopted them, and we started doing remodeling and uh, just helping out the orphanage, and my fondest memory of the orphanage was Christmas Eve, 1966. They invited us, invited us, three of us, for, uh, for dinner. Uh, at the orphanage, and uh, 
they asked uh, asked if we'd sing a, a Christmas uh, carol for the for the kids, and uh, I'd never sang in my life, and I sang "Oh Holy Night," uh, and uh, uh, I sing now, but uh, I don't think I ever sang anything as as great. And you know, the kids probably didn't understand a word. You know, they were all little war orphans, basically, and uh, it was a, it was a great time. The meal was terrible, but <laughs> that monkey stew. What is monkey stew? It was a monkey. No. Yeah, yeah. With with the vegetables, it was just a big pot, and I'll never forget little monkey hand coming up to the <laughs> up to the top and then they had uh, dessert was uh, I don't like fish and dessert was some kind of an aspic a jelly with fish eyes real fish eyes in it and I was sitting right next to the priest and he's giving me this stuff and I don't know how I kept it down <laughs> but I ate my, I ate my dessert <laughs> my buddy dumped his on the floor, but, but uh, now that the orphanage was great, but I think I have some pictures of, of the orphanage in Fantia. And uh, Bill, this is Liz Paulus again, and you had said uh, at one point the uh, uh, Vietnam was pretty instrumental for you, and there was a parade, and I remember you talking about that. I was, uh, <clears throat> my office on the police department was in downtown Chicago, and uh, uh, there was the uh, uh, Vietnam Welcome Home Parade in Chicago, which turned out to be one of the biggest parades in the country, and we didn't realize that a lot of, you know, how big it was going to be, and uh, got, uh, I met a couple couple guys that were they were also combat medics and my brother flew in and the four of us went down and uh, next thing I knew and they told me about this uh, organization Vietnam which was their motto was veterans helping veterans and uh, I became uh, uh, ended up on the board of directors uh, for Vietnam and uh, it was a great organization but uh, that day at the parade you, something happened that was kind of interesting yeah, I was, uh, it actually was the day before the parade, uh, they had the moving wall, which is a replica uh, of the Vietnam Memorial in Washington, and uh, I was just sitting there, and I was, I was writing one of those, one of those poems, and a guy came up to me and uh, goes, Doc, and nobody had called me Doc for, for years, and he says, you don't remember me, do you? And I said, no, and he says, I think I'm probably the first guy you ever treated in Vietnam. I, and that's the only guy I've ever ever met. Yeah. And how he, how he recognized me. Yeah. Yeah. So I had, well, I didn't have gray hair then. Yeah. <laughs> but. And I asked you this question before, but I don't know that you answered me, and that was, what, what was one thing, that one thing that uh, you needed the most when you were doing combat medics kinds of things, that one tool that you were so thankful for? The ability to uh, slow down under under stress. Uh, I, it's, I don't know how I do it or, or why I do it, but uh, when I get in an extremely stressful or dangerous situation uh, happened to me on the police department. I, I can just force myself to slow down and and take things in order and not panic. Yeah. And that's that's served me in everything I do. So my name's Amy Bill yeah. and I was wondering, when you realized the lack of appreciation when you came back to America for what you did in Vietnam, um, how exactly did that hit you? I was bitter. I was bitter. You, you, 
isolate yourself. You know, you start hanging out. The only people you hang out with are other veterans. And uh, uh, at first, uh, it was extremely difficult getting a, getting a job because you you had a farmer tan, and you had short hair, and uh, if you told somebody you were a Vietnam veteran, they wouldn't hire you. So you you really isolate yourself, and um, it uh, a lot of bitterness, a lot of bitterness yeah. at first, uh, but you learn to compensate for it. And, yeah. Before you came back to America, did you already know that people weren't happy with what was going on in Vietnam? Yes, yeah, just just towards the end. Uh, most of the people in, in my my unit uh, were enlisted. Uh, they weren't drafted. Uh, my brothers, uh, my brothers served in Vietnam three years after I did, and everybody was a draftee, and and the the drug culture and everything was uh, was really high. But we were all pretty uh, pretty conservative. Uh, we believed in what we were doing. We started hearing things but were happening. Uh, I got back in, in July of 67, and 68 turned out to be a, a real nightmare for, you know, for Vietnam within the country. Besides the obvious uh, job rejections, were there a lot of bad experiences with just other people in general? Like just walking down the street and somebody would give you a cold look or something. Oh yeah, yeah. I uh, <laughs> the company had given me a little Zippo lighter that was engraved when I came home, and that I was back about two weeks, and I was sitting in the I was sitting in a bar, and uh, <laughs> for some reason. Uh, this guy came over to me and uh, said something about, you know, you must be a vet, you know, baby killer or something like that. And he picks up my lighter and uh, tosses it somewhere and uh, ends it up ended up knocking me off a bar stool. Yeah. And that that was that was pretty common for for people people back then, you know, where if you were, they knew you were a vet. And, or some of us probably provoked it sometimes. But. <laughs> yeah. My name is Lori Kizaman, and I am a volunteer with College Bound AZ also. And listening to you talk for the last few minutes, something really stood out in that you felt the need to serve and you volunteered. Yeah. How do you respond to especially younger people, when they ask you questions like, why would you go to somebody else's country? How is that serving your country? So what, is that, what does that translate to you when you try to explain that to people? It's, you know, it's, it's probably very difficult, you know, for some people to understand why you would want to go somewhere else, but uh, our country, uh, has provided, yeah, you know, throughout its existence, has provided so much, you know, not only for our own people, but but for oppressed people. Uh, I know oppressed is not a is not a great wo word, but but for uh, people that that need, you know, help from the United States, and and we are a very very giving and. Uh, very giving country. Uh, I think it's uh, I think it's an honor to not only serve our country but but to to help other countries throughout the world. And I'm very proud that you know, I was able to do that. And I'm proud of our I'm proud of our troops now. So I have uh, I talked to a lot of the you know, the Gulf War, the Afghan, the Iraqi guys that came back and uh, 
they have a different experience than than we had, but they're both, you know, the thing that amazes me is they're so th thankful for, uh, you know, what what we went through and, and the programs that that we forced the government to to initiate with Agent Orange, PTSD, and uh, things like that. And uh, I I I can't imagine what what they they go through with their multiple tours and everything. Now it just uh, I I think they're all just absolutely outstanding, and they're all. They're all volunteers. So would you say that Vietnam has paved the way for our future services and by serving just basic humankind and human I, rights? I, I think so. You know, Viet, Vietnam is, uh, in some ways, it was really a black mark, you know, on the country from just the culture of what was happening back in the, in the 60s and, and early 70s. But I think... Uh, there are so many, uh, a lot of the guys that served early on in the Gulf War and that were all children of Vietnam vets and I think they, uh, they saw that their, their fathers were very proud of what they did and, and they wanted to follow in the footsteps and it's, uh, you know, I, I can't think of a, a, a higher honor than to, to serve in the military. Yeah. Bill, we would like to thank you for giving your time today for our interview and especially for your service. Well, it was, from my part, it was a real honor to be uh, asked to do this and, and to share as, as much as I could uh, about, you know, my, my experiences, and I hope it, uh, I hope you learned something, even, even of just a little, yeah. and I, I thank you, yeah. and I hope you guys don't discount going into the military, it's a, it's a great, yeah, it's a great, uh, it's a great experience, great experience.